you have uh, employment surge. In the 1980s alone, I'll be getting to this when I talk about Reagan, we added 14 million net new jobs. Europe, during that same time, added zero. In fact, since the 1980s, the U.S. has added over 25 million net new jobs, and Europe has barely created any. So, employment has grown overall with this process of creative destruction. And that brings me to the Pony Express. Because the Pony Express is an example of a business in our past which went out of business overnight. I mean literally overnight. Within a month, they closed the stations, the riders were off doing something else, they were selling the horses, because you hooked up a telegraph line that all of a sudden did the job of the Pony Express. At the time Pony Express was created, you only had two major trails to the west. Uh, two major ways to get um, letters and packages from uh, Missouri uh, over to California if you wanted to go by land. Now, I will add there was a third method if you wanted to go by sea, which was extremely expensive. You could set out from one of the coastal towns in what was called a packet steamer, sail all the way down to Panama. Then you had to unload everything, put it on burros or horses, cart it across the Isthmus of Panama, put it on another packet steamer, sail up to San Francisco, and unload it there. Very, very expensive. So when possible, people like to ship overland via stagecoach. But as you see, uh, even in 1840, this was a difficult undertaking. There were two trails that led out of Missouri or Illinois. One went northward across Kansas, Nebraska, uh, down into um, uh, the, the top part of modern-day uh, Utah and Nevada and crossed through Idaho and eventually went down into Sacramento. Problem with this route was while it was shorter, it was also snowed in about half the year. Uh, almost impossible to get through. You might have heard of that group, the Donner Party, had a little trouble eating, you know. So when you, when you go through that route, you're probably going to have trouble with, with snow. Uh, there are also Indians there, although not nearly as many as in the Southern Route. Southern Route came down and, and cut through modern-day uh, New Mexico, would cut across over here through uh, modern-day Tucson, hook up in San Diego, and then come up the Pacific Coast Highway until it got to San Francisco. Much longer, but it's open all year. Still have to deal with Indians, and so it's still uh, very expensive. The situation was so difficult that naturally the U.S. government got involved. And whenever the government gets involved, you're asking for trouble. And you know what happens when the government gets involved? They have a solution, and in this case the solution was camels. They imported dromedary camels from the Middle East and tried to have them go over the great American desert. Now, I'm from Arizona, and I can tell you that the desert in Arizona is nothing like the desert in Saudi Arabia. It's rocky, it destroys the camel's hooves, as they quickly figured out, and they had to abandon that. It was about 2,000 miles from the furthest west point in Missouri to Sacramento, California, and William Russell, a former freighting entrepreneur who never went to the Great Plains himself, saw an opportunity to make money. He, Alexander Majors, and William Waddell determined that for their freight company to beat out the famous Butterfield stagecoach line, they had to offer something Butterfield couldn't, fast delivery of mail. They conceived of establishing a network of 119 stations. Some of these stations would be... Uh, a simple uh, wooden house, sod house with a corral. Some would be intricate and elaborate forts, depending on whether or not you had to battle Indians. They would hire light young riders to carry priority mail, letters only. The riders would change horses six times during a 200 mile shift. Rider would cover 200 miles, resting after 75 or 100, and then coming back. How many of you, when you ever thought of the Pony Express, thought of one guy riding all the way across from, from Independence, Missouri, to, to Sacramento? Didn't happen. 
they would ride these, these loops or ships. Total riding time from one side of the country to the other, remember we're talking about Missouri to Sacramento, was about 240 hours divided up among the riders. The Pony Express ran an ad. Now try getting away with this one today with all our um, uh, equal opportunity employment regulations and everything else, right? Here's a real Pony Express ad. Wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows not over 18 must be expert riders willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. <laughs> now you say, why in the world would anybody turn out for that? Here's the kicker. Wages, $25 a week. Now, in 1860 money, you're talking like five, six thousand dollars a week wages. You know, but it's like being a pro football player. You can't do that all your life. You're only going to have a short span, even if you avoid the Indians and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's going to pay really well. But that's why people got into it. Uh, here are the here's the Pony Express route as it was finally conceived. It would, a station, such as one of the ones I just showed you, would employ 20 men as riders, require more than 200 horses and mules, use hundreds of saddles. Each of the riders would carry as, uh, on his saddle something called a mochila. Now this is a very bad picture. The only reason I even show this is because it gives you a good shot of the mochila. Um, kind of a, a hokey version of the Mokilla. Uh, this one down here, while it's a little harder to see, is more accurate. The Mokilla was, in essence, a blanket, leather blanket with four bags sewn into it. And you flopped it right over the saddle that you then sat on. Okay? These riders, however, I said before they wanted them light. <laughs> Obviously, this guy, you know, he needs the Atkins diet. Um, but beyond that, you can tell this is kind of a trumped up picture, kind of a fake picture. Why? Besides the fact he's a little overweight for a Pony Express rider. <coughs> what tips you off that this is not a picture of a real rider? What? He's still Pony Wrong. Still Pony Wrong. Actually, I'd probably be a real rider. <laughs> you mean there's no E in pony? <laughs> Come on. They want them light. What what strikes you as being odd about this? He's carrying a rifle, not just a gun. He's carrying a rifle. No Pony Express rider would ever carry a rifle. In fact, even this one, where he has a pistol, is highly stylized. The Pony Express riders, after just a few runs, quit carrying even pistols. They would carry a knife only in case they needed to deal with like a rattlesnake bite or something, but it was just too much extra weight. They wanted to be fast. They figured if they had to fight Indians, you know, they, a pistol wasn't going to do them any good anyway, and so they quit carrying even pistols. At first, they used to have a bugle, and as they got near the station, they would blow on the bugle to, to let the station master know they were coming and he'd be out there with another horse already. Um, even that, they ditched the bugles. The station masters got where they knew when these guys were about to appear, they'd have the horse already. They even got to where they could slap the horse and get it moving. The rider would come in, he'd, he'd get the last energy out of the tired horse. It was said that you could go from one side of the country to the other and the mochila would never touch the ground. They developed these intricate maneuvers that you see in the rodeos whereby they would pop out of the saddle on one side while whipping the mochila out, bounce off the ground, get back in their saddle and flop the mochila on the other horse, grab the other saddle, flip over and do a flip to where they would jump on the other horse at full speed. I mean, these guys didn't believe in wasting time at all. <coughs> 